Okay, good evening, everybody. This is Joe Firestone on Thursday night for Real Progressives. Uh, my guest for tonight was intended to be uh, Lisa McCormick, who is running for the Senate of the United States in New Jersey. Her opponent is uh, Robert uh, Menendez, who's been a longtime senator uh, and is uh, uh, um, extremely well known as a member of the corporate establishment um, uh, in the Senate just the kind of person we would like to uh, to beat now i have no idea why lisa uh, uh has not made an appearance uh as yet but i may have a surprise guest for you in just a moment i can't be sure whether i will or not uh, he is working on it I'm trying to come in if he does he will be very welcome but the way I'm going to start off with this is to actually talk about uh, Lisa's performance. Yes, Jeffrey Hyde says, uh, yep, uh, that um, uh, 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 Senator Menendez has a scandal to boot, as well as being a member of the establishment. Yes, I know. He has a very well-known scandal uh, to boot, but I don't think I want to talk about his uh, scandal because every other politician in New Jersey has a scandal, okay, of some sort. Okay, despite his uh, uh, um, scandal, it's also true that uh, uh, Senator Menendez uh, uh, is, according to the figures I've seen, one of the poorest members of the Senate having only a net worth of 412,000 in terms of the statistics that I saw. So uh, whether he's a member of the corporate establishment um, or not, he thus far has not been able to use it to uh, um, to acquire any vast wealth. Uh, it sounds like uh, almost all of his uh, by net worth is incorporated into uh, some real estate that he probably um, holds, okay, in New Jersey. And if it's only 412000 it must be fairly modest real estate um, at that. Okay. But anyway, he's still a corporate Democrat. He's still the kind of guy we love to beat um, around here because... He's usually wrong on the issues. Uh, he's not as bad as some in the party, but uh, he is also not very good. So I still don't have 
have any sign of Lisa um, or my surprise guest. So what I'm going to do is pinch hit um, for Lisa in hopes that she eventually is going uh, to uh, um, um, show up. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is give you the questions that she received from various progressive groups who have spoken to her and the answers that she came up with. And based on that, uh, you'll see that she's a fairly substantial candidate. And by the way, my surprise guest, uh, who's an expert on New Jersey politics, has now arrived. And he is um, um, an old friend um, um, of our show and RP, John Lancelot. Hi, John. How you doing? Doing great, thanks. Good. I'm doing good. Um, even better since you arrived. Good. Good. I was like treating you these days. Ah, uh, you know, I was busy. You know, doing a lot of research, traveling internationally, um, really digging into the issues of foreign policy and the cyberspace realm, which affects economics. It affects elections. It affects everyday life. And um, it's been really enlightening, you know, hearing from people, uh, not for, only from the United States, but all over the world, who have concerns about the new world that we're in. And definitely the cyber realm has affected our whole lives, everything. I mean, politics, everything we talk about. If we're not talking about affects um, our world, then we're not talking about issues that we could change. And so that's the mission I've been on. I've been on this 24-7, and I get no sleep. Yes, John, it's a wonderful mission. I'm sure you're completely fascinated by it. And I'm sure we'll see it in future attempts of yours to run for uh, office. We'll talk about that mission as we go through the show, because it's a very interesting and fascinating one. But let us start off by discussing uh, the platform, okay, that uh, that Lisa has, in spite of the fact that she's not here tonight, mm -hmm. okay. And why don't we do a commentary um, on, on the platform, place it in the context of New Jersey politics, mm -hmm. uh, which you are certainly um, an expert on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would love to hear uh, by your commentary on it and on the answers that she is giving to the various questions that have been posed to her by progressive groups okay, and organizations. And we can note here, before we start, that she is a person who has signed the CIFAR contract. So she is a CIFAR candidate uh, okay, and even though we are no longer affiliated with um, 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 CFAR, we certainly respect um, candidates who have signed the CFAR pledge and gone even further uh, than what is now in the CFAR pledge. So let's begin to go over some of the questions um, uh, and the answers that um, she gave. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, first question. Do you support a major public investment in infrastructure jobs of at least $1 trillion over five years as called for in a U.S. Senate bill supported by the AFL-CIO and the American Society of Civil uh, um, Engineers in order to repair crumbling schools and highways? Why are the country with high-speed um, uh, internet and ensure that states have the resources needed to keep their teachers, police, and firefighters uh, working? And her answer was, yes! <laughs> she does yeah. um, um, support that. Mm -hmm. uh, have you any comment on that, John? Well, of course. And, uh, you know, I know Lisa, and I, I know her team, and, and they're, you know, they're very well known. They, they um, you know, they've been on the trail for a while. Now they're taking on Bob Menendez, Senator Bob Menendez. So I applaud them for that. It, New Jersey is tough. 
And um, everyone knows that New Jersey is a corrupt state. Uh, and just because it's been like that for a long time. So I definitely agree that infrastructure needs to be uh, an important issue. Um, definitely the internet needs to be a free internet, first of all. You can't do anything without a free internet. Um, obviously there's no uh, freedom of speech without that. And then when it comes to infrastructure, roads, buildings, um, you name it, um, you know, that is number one on the list. So any candidate who's going to take on the establishment, um, and I'm talking about, you know, yeah, if you're, you know, inside the Democratic Party, you know, fine, do that. But what's really going to work is we band together in a coalition and we take them on, and this will be issue number one, is taking on the infrastructure and doing that in a way where Congress can afford it and it's not a thing. It's just that both parties refuse to talk about the real economic issues, and we could talk about that later on. Yes. Uh, um, I'd like to comment on the first question, okay, and answer, though, by saying that uh, what I've always said, that one trillion is too small, and I can't imagine why the AFS, I'm sorry, the ASCE uh, is supporting this bill since uh, in 2017, she called for, uh, okay, it called, I should say, for $2.2 trillion uh, uh, worth of spending uh, on uh, infrastructure to bring it up to snuff. Okay, and earlier in something like 2013 or 2014, it was calling for $3.6 trillion. So which is it, American Society for Civil Engineers? Is it $3.6 trillion? Okay, or is it uh, $2.2 trillion? Or is it $1 trillion? Wonder if anybody's been influenced by the politics of the matter much. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems to me by now it's probably $4.2 uh, and I'll go on record, okay, as saying that. It ain't going to be fixed by $1 trillion in five years. There's no way that's going to happen. Try more like $600 billion per year for six or seven years. That might fix it. Anyway. Right. The next question and answer. Do you support a Green New Deal to create uh, millions of clean energy jobs in areas like wind and solar energy? And Lisa's answer to that question was yes. Okay. Uh, any comments on that, John? Yeah, it is very important, especially from an international perspective, to, to find new policies and ways to garner energy for our society. And obviously, petrol is on its way out, and the gas companies and the petrol companies are fighting to stay on top, and that is unsustainable. So any government that invests in alternative energy will end up being the government that is the top government in the world. And I'm talking about a coalition like Germany and the EU, and that is something that United States, I mean, even China is jumping up on it. So why is the United States um, destined to be behind? Why do the politicians not want us to be ahead of the game? It's confusing to me, but it's obvious that anyone who's running for office or anyone who's currently in office who is not really advocating for alternative energies should not be in politics at all today in the 21st century. Absolutely, John. I think that's right. Uh, what I'm a little dismayed about is that uh, that Lisa did not take the opportunity here in specifying what she wants to do, uh, how extensive uh, the program for clean energy is that she supports. Okay, uh, we know such a program is again one that's going to involve many hundreds of billions per year to actually make a dent in the problem. Okay, it seems to me that in her platform, there should be some specific description of what kinds of jobs are necessary to create and how much money we would have to spend 
there, there's been a lot of research in this area by now. And people have a pretty good idea of what is required. It seems to me it's the responsibility of candidates to have researched that and to be clear on what size program they want to have. Uh, yeah. Okay, a third question can answer. Do you support passing a full employment act guaranteeing that any American who wants a job will have one, including public works projects like repairing bridges and roads, wiring uh, rural America with high speed uh, internet and other long term investments in the um, economy? And again, she said, yes, uh, uh, I do. Now, that sounds like a commitment to a federal job guarantee to me. So it seems like it goes beyond the original CFAR contract and commits to something more. Now, she didn't say here that this um, 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 should be the living wage, but um, down below, she answers the question, do you support raising the minimum wage to $12 or more and indexing it to the cost of living so its value does not erode over time. So Lisa is now calling me over the phone. So I'll, I'll try to get her in over the phone if I can. Um, hi, Lisa. Um, hi, Lisa. I don't know what she's trying to say or what she was um, sending to me, but she can still come in. She still has the guest link, so she can join our discussion. So her, answer, uh, so her answer to that was, no, I support raising the minimum wage to $15 or more and indexing it to the cost of living. So it seems to me there that she's a little more advanced than the CFAR, Oh, let me see if I can get her now. Uh, hi, Lisa. Um, um, hi, hi. Uh, I, I, can you hear? Yes. Oh, wow, there I am. My glasses. Okay. Yes. Okay. I can certainly hear you, Lisa. Yeah, I'm looking. It says Facebook went to full screen. Can you just make sure exit this? Just give me a second. My computer is using uh, Microsoft Edge. I don't know if that's causing a problem. Okay, can you shift to Chrome? If, if, if you can shift to Chrome and you use the link that I no. sent you, then you can join our discussion here. Okay, can you hear me now, now at all, or how do I have to do this? Okay, the way you have to do this is... Okay. I see me on my screen, but I don't see you. Okay, well, you ought to see me because I see me on my screen, which means I must be visible to you. Here you are. Now I can see you. All right, good. Okay, very good. So my point, okay, is this. I sent you a friend request um, some time ago, maybe two hours ago now, and if you uh -huh. accept the request, then you will find a message and you will also find a link. Um, to our discussion here, and you will be able to join us. Uh, we're going okay. through your platform now. Perfect. Okay, and generally uh, we are very complimentary about it. We'd certainly like to have you as part of the discussion. Okay, and John Lancelot is here. Okay, and John says that he is a friend of yours. Okay, and he has been complimentary about your platform uh, uh, as well. So you can click on the guest link and you can join um, our discussion, uh, but very easily. Um, please use a computer and also Chrome. And we will have lots of time to discuss your platform. Okay. Now, what do you have me on that you can hear me now? Is that... Uh, okay, the way I can hear you now is you've called me on my iPhone. Okay, so okay. that... Okay, so that... Uh, I'm not sure whether you called me on Facebook. Um, I did. I called you from Facebook. Okay. 
So uh, you've called me on Facebook, which means you probably have accepted my friend request already, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you should have the guest link. So click on the guest link to this broadcast and join this broadcast. Okay. Okay, so. And, okay, uh, before that, there's a longer message I sent you with the guest link in it. Okay. What do you do? Okay, so all you have to do is click on the guest link to come in. Okay? Yeah, he just closed, I think he just closed my message. My message. Hang on. Because I, did, I, I think you're right. I think it was, we had to scroll up. Right. I think all you have to do is scroll up. Find the message with the guest link in it, and click on the uh, guest link, and you're here. Okay? I, yeah, I went to scroll up, and my computer froze. You can hear her, too. <laughs> huh, I'm sorry? I said I went to scroll up, and my computer froze. It didn't let me go to the link. Okay. Uh, um, try disconnecting from the phone call. Okay, and just um, try to find the link and uh, okay. uh, come in when you get it. It only takes a second to get in uh, okay. when you find it. Okay, and you click on it. Okay, John and I will be here waiting for you. Okay, okay thanks. Bye. All right. Okay, so she should be here in a minute to join us. Absolutely. We'll probably have a very good time, but as I said, she is in support of raising the minimum wage to $15 or more and indexing it to the cost of living, which implies that she would be fully in support of a job guarantee program that would set a wage of um, $15 an hour, as Bernie Sanders' proposal uh, is uh, about doing now. So apparently she would be in favor okay, of that. Uh, okay, so the next question is, uh, let's see, did we miss something? Oh, yeah. She also was asked the question, do you support an Employee Free Choice Act, um, EFCA, along the lines of the original proposal in 2007, which would increase democracy in the workplace with card check uh, elections? And she said yes to that. Of course. And I think we both agree that's a good thing also, right? Anything that's good for the working class and working people in this country, I'm all for it. So we're also in agreement with her um, on that. So the next question was, do you support um, um, eliminating the loopholes that allows employers to pay tipped workers less than the minimum wage? And she said yes. Yeah. And we support that, too. Yeah, absolutely. We, str we strongly support that um, People as more. well. People got to live. Right. And then she asked, she was asked, do you support repealing Taft-Hartley, uh, which allows anti-union right-to-work laws in the states? Um, I certainly support that. Do you support it, John? I mean, absolutely, Joe. Um, you know, there should be no barrier to the prosperity of somebody who works every day to put food on their table for their family and to improve their education and to live a decent life. There should be no barrier to that. So anything that removes those barriers, I'm for. So we are with Lisa on that also. Okay, so next she was asked, do you oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, 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 trade deal? And she said yes. Okay. And when she arrives here, mm -hmm. which uh, hopefully will be shortly now, okay, when uh, she arrives here, um, I would like to ask her uh, in just a little more detail whether she supports uh, the ISDS clauses in the TPP, the TTIP, and the TISA, and also NAFTA, and all the other trade deals that we've signed now since, what was it, 
when this all started since 1976. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that she would know what the ISDS clause is because it's very important to know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we will ask her when she arrives. She was asked, do you oppose fast track, which allows a vote with no opportunity uh, for amendments or filibusters on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Bill and any other trade deals that are negotiated by presidents over the next um, six years? Uh, I'm not sure the premise of that question is correct. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall it, when Fast Track, was approved um, in the first place, it was approved for a limited period of time, uh, not for six years, something like through 2018 or 2000, okay, and 19. Okay, I'd have to refer to my book to check on that. But the point being that uh, uh, there was going to be an opportunity to refuse to consent to an extension of six to six years, if I'm not mistaken, okay, if I'm right about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there would be something of an opportunity to get rid of that if we got enough progressives into the Congress right, to really carry the Democratic Party. The only reason why it passed in 2015 was because 28 um, Democrats, including Debbie Wasserman Schultz, um, but decided to vote um, for it. So it was, we, there were 188 Democrats at the time, 160 Democrats uh, voted for it. Nancy Pelosi played games rather than opposing it, only opposed it um, uh, in the last day, did not exert any party discipline on it which is the reason why it passed. Had she insisted uh, that people vote against it, whether they desire to or not, she certainly could have gotten uh, um, uh, another 10 or 12 votes out of the Democrats and defeated Fast Track. Mm -hmm. So I think the responsibility for the passage of Fast Track can be laid at her door on uh, uh, in this case, I was not fooled by her shenanigans on that particular bill. Absolutely. Anyway, Lisa certainly opposed that. Uh, she also was asked, do you support fair trade that protects uh, 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 the American workers, the environment, okay, and also jobs? And she said yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you any comments on that? Well, you know, um, we're in a different world where, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about, and I agree, um, absolutely. Um, and we're in a world where now we want new energy, new jobs. We want, um, you know, everything new, new infrastructure. It's going to take education and, and better jobs. And we want pay where it's the living standard. Anything that's against that, um, against the, you know, the betterment of the country, I'm opposed to it. I'm opposed to living back in the 20th century style economies or anything that detriments um, a segment of the population. And so I'm for progressive policies. And, and another thing I want to comment about, the Democratic Party is standing in the way of this progress. You know, we're here and, and it's very important that we watch what happens this year because we're here talking about, you know, bare knuckles policy, which is something that they should be doing on Capitol Hill, which you're not doing. Um, but we're doing it right here on the streets. We're discussing very fine details of what should be going on. But what's the Democrats? What are they doing? They're hampering progressives from getting elected. And that's the only reason why I don't mess with the Democrats anymore, because I don't think they're actually going to be able to push the policies that we're even talking about. And so, yes, I agree that these policies should go forward, but what's in the way is a party that does not want to see this project um, project go on, and absolutely that they are helping the Republicans stay in power. And and so it's something that we have to continually discuss, uh, that how are we going to get these policies 
into Capitol Hill so it could legislate on it and send it to a progressive president's desk. That's the plan that we should be going on. Yes. As you also stated in your Dem exit interviews um, some time ago, mm -hmm. you're still firmly in favor of a Dem exit. Absolutely. And so am I firmly in favor uh, of, of that. And we got a big boost a few weeks ago when Tim Canova stepped out of the Democratic Party. Absolutely. And decided not to take any more crap and to run as an independent. And that right. really wow. did my heart good. I love to see that. Yeah, you know, that's a very wise decision on his part. It because, was a very wise decision. Because we have to realize that we don't have all the time in the world. So we're giving it a chance this year. We're giving it, they're giving the Democrats a chance to change, but there's been no sign of it. And those of us who are independents are talking about policies to move the country forward. So that's why I've been intent on doing what I'm doing behind the scenes to make sure that when it comes time for us to rise, that we're actually gonna have policies to present to the people and not just say, well, just vote for me. No, it's gonna take an effort from all of us. Politics is not a spectator sport. We all have to take part in it. And so, yes, um, uh, Tim uh, made a very wise move. He did make a very wise move. And uh, I suppose uh, my best or biggest comment on that is that why run in a fixed uh, but primary? Why run in a party that asserts its right to fix its primaries while a, a loudly asserting to everybody that all its primaries are fair? It boggles my mind. And, and you know what? It boggles my mind, too. And it boggles my mind that people would be so stupid as to run in those primaries anyway. The advantage these parties have, which makes it scares people, is like, look, we're going to be here forever. We've been here forever. You can't go around us. Anyone that's ever played the sport of football knows that if you can't run around somebody, you run into them. And so what we have to do is run into both of them and knock them down. It's physics. If you're going to sit there and say, well, we have to, like, you know, work with the Democratic Party, the clock is running down. You have to have another play. Now, I've spoken to people all over. Like, I, I speak to people every day. And every single person, it doesn't even matter whether they're progressive or, or, or um, uh, conservative or whatever their bent is, that they're sick to death of both parties. They, but they don't have a way to go. There's nothing, uh, there's no place for them to go. So those of us who are politicals and very well astute in politics, we have to figure out how to build a way for us to connect with the 50% of the population that will not bother to get up the vote for either party. That's what we have to do. That's a political revolution. And all this stuff going back inside of the uh, Democratic Party is just time wasting. And that's just my opinion. I respect the opinions of people who say, like, no, we have to work from within. But for me, it's more of an urgency that we have to figure out another way. I think so, too. And I think uh, we have to run over them. And Mark Fabian says, no, through them. <laughs> but I think we all have the same idea. Yeah, run. We got to run over them. We got to run through them. We got to um, knock them down. We got to. Yeah. And all that. And we, we have to touch it down. Make the touchdown. Make the score. Make the score. We have to have a movement that is powerful enough that it cannot be resisted. And the way to do it is by getting that 60% of the population to vote in uh, those states where there are open primaries. Then maybe they get into the Democratic Party and overwhelm the fixing. And in other states where there are not um, open primaries, then maybe they get into the Green Party and overwhelm them uh, by electing Green Party candidates, okay, or um, Independent Party candidates. 
And there's a strategy also beyond running um, in the Democratic primary. And that is if you happen to run in the Democratic primary and you can get by the fixing in some way, because maybe in some states the fixing is not that much of a problem. Like, for example, in Minnesota, in some of the districts, it still appears that those primaries are fair. Maybe that's because of, you know, of Minnesota nice, or maybe it's because, okay, of other reasons. But uh, some of the candidates I talk to from out there say, no, that there's not really any um, um, systematic cheating going on here. This ain't Wisconsin, okay? Uh, you know, they'll say stuff like that, and maybe they're right. And if they are right, maybe it makes sense to um, um, uh, to run in there, and maybe you can win there. But once you do win, it seems to me then you're a fool to stay in the Democratic Party. If Tim Canova wins or some Green Party candidates win out in California, okay, or in um, um, some other states, then all the progressives need to get um, um, together and form a people's party. When you're in Congress, you can switch parties. You don't have to stay in the party, okay, that elected you, okay? You can switch parties. It's been done again and again and again when the party is out of step with the person who was elected from a particular district. If the Democratic Party does not change, if it does not reject fixing primaries, okay, and uh, but things like that, then if progressives are elected into the Democratic Party, to stay there would be betraying the movement. They should switch parties, form that third party with a foothold in the Congress of 20, 30, 40 representatives sufficient to hold the balance of power in the Congress and shift the whole kit and caboodle over to being a people's party or a people's Congress. There's potential for doing that, potential for getting outside of the party system and doing that. So I sent the link to Lisa again. She doesn't seem capable okay, of using it. Uh, but uh, let's go on here with her uh, uh, platform. Absolutely. Do you support uh, modernizing overtime rules? So employees making less than 51000 a year are eligible for overtime pay. 51000 is approximately what the threshold would be today if the rates set in 1975 were adjusted for um, uh, uh, inflation. And she said yes. Uh, what do you think of that? Yeah, if a worker needs to get, you know, they want to stay over. They, they're very motivated about their job. They want to stay past their time and work more. I have nothing against that. They should be able to do that. That's their worker, right? They do want to make some extra money. Of course, the company has to figure out what's within their means of doing it, but it should be the right of a, a motivated worker to say, you know what? I want to stay two extra hours. I want to th stay three hours to do my work. And uh, that's perfectly reasonable to me. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, that's something that's going to take some discussion between workers and companies. And that's why in this country, we have to have a very real conversation is how we're going to move forward. And if you cut off overtime, you're not giving the worker any choice. Yep. Yep. I completely agree. And I agree that I don't even think 51,000, okay, is a reasonable sort of level. I think it should not only be adjusted for inflation, but it should be adjusted for productivity changes also since then. I Absolutely. feel that way about the minimum wage also. I think in much of the country, $15 an hour doesn't make it. It's not a living wage, okay, in um, those parts of the country. And if the federal job guarantee is going to fulfill the concept, that it's a federal job guarantee uh, at a living wage. It should be cost adjusted uh, for locality, it seems to me, and should range between 
uh, let's say 15 and you know, 26 or 27 or 28 or whatever the cost adjustment actually produces. And there are companies, I want to say, there are companies that actually let workers have that choice. So companies are deciding that they value their workers, but it's not enough. We need more people at the table, more workers having their rights, um, you know, fulfilled. But the thing is for me, this is the thing for me. This is why I don't trust the Democratic Party. How long they've been sitting on this issue? You think all of a sudden now they're going to want this stuff? They've been, well, how long has it been? Both parties have been causing this trouble and people are suffering today. As we speak now, people are suffering. And so I'm not yes. going to let the Democratic Party go just because they want to, oh, well, you know, we want to be progressive. We know that the Democratic Party is going against progressive policy. Yes, and they are suffering uh, because of the Democratic Party as much as they're suffering because of the Republican Party. Because the Democratic Party has run basically pretending that it is for the people and will do things for the people. And then when they got into office and had control of the government okay, in 2009, they immediately sold out to the corporate interests. Absolutely. And I'll tell you about the first sellout. The, uh, there's a few of them. But Cory Booker, I want to say on the record, total sellout. Because um, basically, he's been up there. He hasn't introduced none of the policies that we're discussing. Have you heard anything about it? No. He... He coddles uh, uh, corporations like Bain, who go into companies and rip them up and and uh, uh, fire workers. That's Cory Booker for you. So I don't trust none of them. I don't trust none of them. They're, they're going to have to convince me that they're real progressives. But as far as I'm concerned, Democratic uh, Party is just as bad as the Republican Party. Yep. It it has simply it has simply served a safety valve kind of uh, um, 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 function to drain pressure from the people off, to give it um, um, some kind of a relief okay, by giving us the feeling that we have won some elections and we have elected some candidates who are promising change so things might be better for us. But in the end... Most of those candidates, except the very few, um, sell out. In the end, they sell out. So, on to the next item. Uh, will you vote against any bill that cuts, cuts Social Security benefits, Medicare benefits, or Medicaid benefits, including raising the retirement age and cutting cost of living adjustments? And in parenthesis, um, but benefit cuts can be defined as anything that makes beneficiaries pay more for their care. And Lisa says yes. And then uh, it's asked, do you support adding trillions to Social Security's current surplus by scrapping the cap so that uh, millionaires and billionaires pay Social Security taxes on more than just the 118500 of their uh, income. Uh, so she says yes to that. So would you like to comment on that? I mean, yeah, of course. Who want, Look, if Europe could do it, we can do it. I, you know, these politicians make us sound like we have no we have no means to take care of our people here in the United States. And I'm sick of that. I'm sick of the whole I'm sick of the whole like, well, you know, we got to like, you know, they talk about deficits and all this bull crap, which, you know, we know that they're flowing smoke. But we know that, you know, the the uh, the job guarantee is is a real thing. Um, we know that we could afford um, uh, programs they call entitlements. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we didn't ask to be born on this planet, nonetheless, this country. So we have to take care of our people so they could prosper. And we have the ways of doing it, but we have bullheaded politicians who just want to get elected every year and not care about the common human being and even our environment. We need to get them out because they don't want to vote for policies like we're talking about. So, yeah, if you're also, if you're running as a progressive and you really feel that 
you want to break through, whether you're running inside or outside, better outside as far as I'm concerned, involve the people. Don't speak at them. Don't make the, don't tell them what you're going to do or whatever, because you can't do anything without the people. Let them know that they have to be a part of the process in order for change to happen. It's not a spectator sport. Otherwise, you're not going to win. Money's going to beat you out. Okay, so here is the huge question. Okay, and it is, what happens if you get into a situation where, as someone um, in Congress, you can pass um, um, an expansion of Social Security, a substantial expansion of Social Security, but you cannot do it and scrap the cap um, as well. Because what happens if you get down into the bargaining sessions and you go in with the idea, we're going to scrap the cap, Uh, because we want to expand Social Security by one-third. Okay, and we have a lot of steam behind this in the public. And the deal gets put on the table. Um, okay, we won't agree to scrapping, uh, <laughs> to scrapping the cap. But we will agree to expanding Social Security by one third. Okay, then what do you do? So that's the question. Well, okay, I would want to know how Lisa would answer that question. Of course, I want to know how you would answer that question. And then I'll answer that question. Okay, that, so uh, how would you answer that question? Well, um, what I would propose in that case, if they did not want to remove the cap, is to push it to the cap. Push it to the maximum. No, None of this wimpy stuff. If you don't want to re remove the limit, then push it to the limit. Because we want more than that. The people want more. And they will tell the people, look, we want to push it to the limit. They want to keep their limits, but we want to push it to the limit. And we need more pressure to remove it. But not anything under because that's just showing that we're weak okay no, no. well i would say this i would say this it's very valuable to social security recipients to get that expansion done by one third right now not a year from now or two years from now but right now because many of them are struggling and by accepting this deal we would be delivering for them. We can always come back the next year and talk then about scrapping the cap. Okay? So uh, the question that arises now, of course, is, well, if we don't scrap the cap, um, uh, how do we pay for it? Uh. So the answer... <laughs> The answer about how we pay for it is we do this. I'm going to place this on solo now, John. I don't think you've seen this yet. Oh. Okay. That's good. Question. Your programs look expensive. How are you going to pay for them? <laughs> answer. We're Congress. We'll just order the Federal Reserve to give Treasury the money. That's the answer to the question. Have you ever heard that answer before? I love that answer because it's true. It's, it's true. It's true, and it's a sound bite. It, yes, it's a sound bite, and and it's a very and you know what I've presented this sort of uh, conversation to many lay people just on the street, people I just met, and they they're aware that Congress could has the power to do this sort of thing. It's just that, uh, you know, on the news, and you know, people, old deficit, all this stuff, we can't spend money. But deep down inside, every American knows that Congress has the power to purse and there's no bank lording over it. Right. 
So the point is people do know that. It would be plausible to people. And it's something you can shove in the face of a CNN questioner or some idiot um, um, I like that who raises the question. And if they come back with something thereafter, essentially doubting that, it's very easy to reply okay, and say to them, are you telling me you doubt that we, the Congress, have the power to just order the Federal Reserve to give Treasury the money? Are you seriously saying that? And I think that would really set them back uh, uh, on their heels. But if they continue to be stubborn about it, then it's very easy to do this. It's very easy to present to them the legislative language that could be put in the appropriation bill. Two sentences. The first sentence pays for whatever the spending is for. In other words, it forces the Fed to place the money in the Treasury spending account. The second sentence forces the Fed to place the money in the Treasury spending account to repay whatever debt instruments fall due during the period of the appropriation. Beautiful. So it pays down the debt. Yeah. This, this short clause of two sentences... Uh, uh, these massive appropriation bills, 2,300 pages, 1,300 pages, can't even read through the whole thing. They are fi finally introduced in Congress. In 24 hours, people are supposed to decide to vote for or against these appropriation bills. They can't possibly get them read. But this is just like half a page in the appropriation bills, boilerplate right at the end. Within six months of placing this in an appropriations bill, the debt terrorism shtick is dead. Um, you want to know why? Mm -hmm. Because within six months, roughly $4 trillion in debt would be paid off with this one little sentence um, in an appropriations bill. It would be paid, and no more debt would need to be sold in order to pay down the debt that fell due during that particular period. Mm -hmm. So if this were an appropriation bills for 30 years on, the debt instruments of the United States that would be out there, the total debt subject to the limit that would be out there would fall to zero. Mm -hmm. Unless we decided for some special purpose um, not to allow it to fall to zero. Like, for example, in World War II, we issued uh, war bonds to people because we wanted to drain purchasing power out of the private sector uh, so people would not buy goods because we didn't have the capacity to produce the consumer goods at the time, we were completely consumed by the war effort. Absolutely. We didn't want people buying. We wanted to give them uh, a good deal on savings to prevent that, so we issued the war bonds. We might have to do something similar in the future, which mm -hmm. would then create some debt to be paid off. But barring something like that, there would be no debt subject to the limit for 30 years, okay, if we used this kind of scheme. Absolutely. And, you know, I would love to, for you to send those slides to me because I, um, I, I think they're very detailed and very short where you could implement them in a bill. And it just seems like these elected officials and politicals who are in Democrat Republican parties don't understand basic economics. They don't understand even basic algebra, how it even works mathematically and in actuality. Um, I definitely agree 110% that that's the way to go. And that's Okay, so I'm certainly going to send these to you. I've got four slides um, on this. I've shown you two of them, the briefest one and the most detailed of the slides. And I have second and third uh, uh, um, the slides as well. And the reason why I've got the second and third slides is because 
Okay. The first slide is for the 15 second answer. Mm -hmm. okay. The second slide is for the minute answer. Mm -hmm. And the third slide is for the two minute answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fourth slide is when you've got maybe five minutes to explain it all. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Because I know what goes on in these forums. And I know people are time limited in those particular forums. Okay. So what I want to know is whether Lisa McCormick subscribes to something like this or whether she's encountered it or whether she has heard about it. Because as far as I can see, the things she's agreed to will involve really massive spending. And the way that spending can be done without running afoul of the terrorists who purvey the debt nonsense is to use this against them. This is the kind of thing she has to use. She has to be able to answer the how you're going to pay for it question. And there's nothing in her questions and answers to suggest that she knows how to do that or how to turn that question aside. If she got into a debate at all with Menendez, which she probably won't have a chance to do, but if she got into a debate with him, the first thing he would have to ask is, look, Lisa, I'm for all this, but I know that it can't be paid for. Why don't you know that? Why can't you answer the question, how are you going to pay for it? And then her proper answer would be, I can answer it. Here's the answer. Mm -hmm. We're Congress. We're going to order the Federal Reserve to put the money in the Treasury spending account. Right. You think we can't do that, Bob? You <laughs> think we can't do that? Yeah, you know, like there's a lot of those establishment politicians. They love that. I, I even heard some progressives, uh, uh, lo you know, no one here but just in general, who asked that same question. And it's just, a, they don't understand what Congress actually does when it comes to the political economy and don't even really understand how currency, fiat currency works. So this is great policy. I would implore anyone who's running for office who wants to win to listen to what's going on tonight, to what we're talking about, because we're talking about real politics we're talking about a way to win and to shove the establishment aside and to bring the people into the fold. Okay, so John, uh, I'm not sure you know about this, but uh, uh, Johnny Axum, who is a real progressive, Johnny, but, but is also a candidate for Congress in the Minnesota First, okay, as you might know. Yeah has established the 116th Congressional uh, Coalition. And that coalition now has more than uh, 30 candidates, most of whom by now have been uh, interviewed and who have seen these slides uh, in the interviews. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but same as you. Yes. In fact, uh, but Johnny... Um, um, can we get uh, John into the coalition? He'd be real nice to have around if we could get him into the coalition. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, Let's do okay, it. and people Let's keep saying, people keep saying Lisa is in the lobby. I am watching the lobby. I have the lobby right here. If Lisa was in the lobby, I would immediately be able to hook her up. Now, maybe she's having a problem with her camera. So she can't get into the lobby, but I've sent her the link now twice. I'll be happy to send it to her a third time, okay, if she needs to have it sent a third time. But as far as I know and as far as I can see, there's no sign of Lisa um, in the lobby, and I'm constantly looking for her. So uh, anyway, I can't see her in my lobby, and I'm the one that can see the be live lobby i don't think it's visible to you guys okay so she, she says 
Uh, uh, so Johnny Axum is saying, she says it's frozen in the lobby. So Mark Fabian says, uh oh, maybe Lisa went into the wrong building. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yes, Microsoft Edge is likely reflecting it due to code errors, is my guess. In my message to Lisa, uh, Lisa, I suggested you use Chrome. I suggested you use Chrome with your computer. I'm on Chrome. Why, why did you decide to use Microsoft Edge, for God's sake? Okay. Anyway, so getting back to Lisa's platform, yeah. which is a very, very good one again. I agree. Uh, uh, given that corporations are increasing, increasingly eliminating pensions, do you support the call from Elizabeth Warren and others in Congress to expand Social Security benefits paid for by scrapping the cap on what high income um, uh, 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 on what high income um, earners pay into Social Security, resulting in an average worker? receiving $1,570 more per year by age 75 and twenty-one thirty-one more per year by age um, 85. Uh, and she says to that, uh, yes. Have you got a response to that? Um, yeah. Like I said before, any policies that help the average American worker, I'm for. So I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement that, look, um, I don't think a cap, like, you know, we had like this, um, uh, the debt ceiling, you know, we, we love caps in this country, uh, uh, a debt ceiling or whatnot. Um, I have friends who are very well acquainted with the uh, parliament in the UK and they tell me that they have no such cap. I don't know why. Uh, yeah. They don't have a debt ceiling in the UK. They don't have a debt ceiling in Australia. They don't have a debt ceiling in, uh, by New Zealand. They don't have a debt ceiling in Canada. Uh, the only country that is a monetary sovereign that has a debt ceiling is the United States. And why? Because of our peculiar history, we put in the debt ceiling so Congress would have a say about what was spent or would have a second say concerning mm -hmm. what was spent by Woodrow Wilson in the First World War. Okay, The debt ceiling was passed in 1917. After we entered uh, the First World War, and it was passed by progressives, and it was passed for the purpose of giving them a second say, so war spending would not get uh, out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I don't think the debt ceiling is the cause of the national debt. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the cause of national debt, as Mark Fabian says, is leftover gold standard uh, 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 thinking. So, um, Johnny Axum says, learn more about uh, Lisa McCormick at her website. Uh, she is a member of the 166th. But uh, Johnny, of course, as you know, since you founded the group, it's the 116th Congressional Coalition. And uh, Lisa McCormick's website is uh, lisamccormick.org. HTTP, of course, the uh, 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 front slash, uh, uh, front slash, uh, lisamccormick.org. Uh, uh, and by the way, uh, the things that I've been reading out um, tonight are from her website, they're the questions and answers that she's given uh, uh, um, on her website, which constitute a platform. Okay, so my comment on this latest, uh, do I support uh, the, uh, the Elizabeth Warren and others in Congress to expand SS benefits by scrapping the cap? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like to scrap the cap so the burden of taxation is more fairly spread out um, over the population. So for me, uh, this is a fairness issue. 
But it's not a necessity issue. If I can't scrap the cap, I'm still going to want to raise the Social Security benefits for reasons uh, uh, that I discussed um, already. And not only that, but I don't want to be a piker and raise it 1570 more per year by age 75 and $2,131 more per year by uh, 85. I want to give Social Security uh, recipients a living wage equivalent stipend right now. Okay. If it turns out that this would be too inflationary in one gulp, then phase it out over three or four years. But by four years from now, I want it done. I want them to have a living wage benefit as the pensions in Europe are. Roughly in Europe, they're twice what we have here. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the causes uh, of uh, or the degree of inequality we have here. Those causes lie in things like a lousy safety net. They lie in the fact that we don't have a job guarantee. They lie in the fact that our unions are practically dead. They lie in the fact that we allow business and, and not just free market-based business, but businesses of all kinds, huge businesses, businesses fixing the markets and still fixing the market and fixing prices and doing all kinds of questionable things not in line even with capitalism or free market theory. And we've allowed them to do what they want, and that has resulted in the degree of inequality we have today in the United States. It is a frickin' scandal. We have sat still for it for too long. we got to get rid of it now, okay? No more screwing around. Find the candidate who is not bought by the corporates and vote for that candidate. It doesn't matter what party they're in. It doesn't matter whether they're Greens or they're independents, okay, um, or they're Democrats. If they are candidates that you think are sincerely in favor of dropping the corporate stuff like a hot potato and voting for the people, you get them in there. We have interviewed this year already lots of Democrats who are like that. Uh, and we'll interview more. They're coming up in the next week. We'll interview them continuously. They are for the people. It's visible they're for the people. Great Green Party candidates, also for the people. Great people running as independents, also for the people. Don't be afraid to vote for them. Your survival depends on it. Setting this country right uh, depends on it. But even more, as I just said, your survival depends on it because they're the only ones who are going to do anything about the climate crisis. All the rest are just going to fold over and forget it. They're just going to lay down and die and take their money while they're dying. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's sick. It's sick. And, 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 and here's another thing. What we've been living under is an assertion of power from these institutions. A big business, whether you want to call these uh, politicians or trying to stay in office, it's a form of authoritarianism, okay? It's a form of converting our democracy and delegitimizing it and keeping power for themselves. That cannot stand, so stop supporting it. Find an alternative. Now, the only thing I want to say about the Green Party, which I, I, I support them in essence, but what they have to do is be less rigid with their platform because there's a lot of progressives who have different views on different things. And so the handicap that the Green Party has had is that their platform is too rigid and they're immovable nearly. And also, um, it's going to take more than the Green Party to bring progressives together. It's going to take independence. And we might have to build a bigger coalition beyond progressives. So let's not get stuck in one mode of doing things that we've been doing for the past 20 years. We had to develop a new way and a new policy platform that has room for different philosophies. 
Uh, okay, I'm not sure how far we can go with that, and the reason why I say that, okay, and I, I, okay, I kind of do believe that, okay, but I think that where the boundary has to be drawn is that there are many other philosophies that are corporate friendly and corporate based and there cannot be any room for them in this particular movement oh absolutely not because this is the line that we have to draw now there are room for all kinds of people here comes lisa she's in the lobby nice and i am bringing her in i still don't see her uh, I still don't see a camera, so I'm not sure we're going to see her. Ah, here she is. So I'm going to show here. her right now. Hi, we made it. You you made it. Oh, my God. Hi, good An evening. Hour in okay, God. we're happy to see you here. Okay, we're very happy to see you here. What I'd like to ask you to do, okay, is adjust your face on the screen because... Half your face is uh, uh, cut off. Ah, now it's better. Okay, now it's better. Okay. And, and also lower your volume a little bit because we're getting some feedback from you. Okay. Okay, so now everything okay is okay. We have been going over uh, the questions okay, and answers um, on your website. And we are now down to, uh, do you support saving taxpayers approximately $230 billion over 10 years um, um, by allowing Medicare um, um, and also Medicaid to negotiate prices with pharmaceutical companies? And you said yes, that you were in support um, of that. Okay, but let's right. sort of take a step. Uh, uh, backwards on this uh, to consider one question. I think we have pretty much approved of things that you have said you support here. Okay, where we have not approved, it's because uh, we would go further. Like, for example, on the one trillion dollar bill, okay, for uh, infrastructure um, over five years. We know Bernie Sanders uh, supports that, but uh, right. we also think that it's too little, that the problem is far larger. Okay, in John's right. case, I guess he's somewhere in the $2 trillion range, I think, or maybe the $3 trillion range, and I'm at, uh, up to $4.6 trillion now, and I can talk about uh, exactly why that's true. But I am convinced it can't be done for a trillion dollars. And I think the only reason why Bernie has proposed that is because he's afraid if he proposed what it's really going to cost, that everybody would be totally laughing at him because they're already laughing at him uh, because he's talking about a trillion dollars over five years. Okay? And what I think is that we need to be educating the public. The American Society for uh, um, um, for Civil Engineers, who supports the $1 trillion suggestion, by the way, in 2013 and 2014, they were saying the bill was $3.6 trillion. And last year, they moved down to $2.2 um, $2 trillion dollars. And now they're down, uh, you know, they're down to one trillion dollars. Obviously, they're responding to political pressure. That's not what they really think. Their right. original three point six trillion dollars was probably what was um, on the mark. Okay, and it probably would have been even more because they were not actually projecting that bill out to the future. It was $3.6 trillion back in 2012, 2013. But, of course, if right. you're going to do it over six years, there are other costs that um, um, uh, uh, enter in. The nominal dollar cost expands. 
And so you got to be thinking about a total of 4.2 trillion or 4.6 trillion that you have to spend over six or seven years. Okay, and uh, nobody is even mentioning that. Okay, and right. uh, you know they've got to do it. And it seems to me when you're running in a race like yours, where you're an underdog, okay, um, but two Menendez, a real underdog. You have nothing to lose by going full bore right. and trying to excite, the, you know, the imagination, okay, of people and saying, look, this guy is not really telling you the truth, okay? In other words, even if he supports a $1 trillion bill, okay, uh, uh, you can come out and say, this guy is not telling you the truth. The bridges and roads and the schools, okay, and all the elements of our infrastructure are falling down all across the country. The bill is going to be a lot larger than that. And then you defend uh, that um, sort of opinion. Okay, but I, I was also very interested in uh, uh, your statements on wind and solar energy, uh, your support for a federal job guarantee, okay, which appears to be in your platform right now, and your support for a lot of other things that are going to cost a lot um, of money. Now, if you ever do get into a debate with him, okay, or if anybody else happens to notice you in this fight and brings you on to a CNN program or something like that so that they can tell the story of uh, you know, the courageous lady in New Jersey who is fighting Menendez. I mean, it's an underdog story. So they ought to be picking it up. These idiots ought to be picking it up. It's good for viewership. Okay. When they pick it up, the first thing they're going to ask you, Lisa, is how are you going to pay for it? And you got to mm -hmm. know how to, uh, uh, how to answer the question. And taxing people to pay for it isn't going to cut it because even placing much, much higher taxes on people, uh, what are you going to get out of that? $400, $500, $600 $600 dollars a year more out of that? It's not going to pay for it. It's not going to pay for fighting um, the climate change. Uh, you might need a $2 trillion a year bill to fight climate change and to introduce the kind of solar energy stuff uh, that we need. So, what I wanted to show you was this. Okay. Uh, okay. And by the way, I recall you're a member of the 116th um, uh, um, a coalition, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you're also one of the admins on the site. Uh, am I wrong about that? I'm trying to see your graphics. Small for me. Okay. And okay. Uh, okay. I'm going to go solo with the graphic right now. Okay? Okay. So the graphic right. asks the question, your programs look uh, expensive. How are you going to pay for them? And the answer is, or the shortest answer is, we're the Congress. We'll just right. order the Federal Reserve to give Treasury the money. Right. So you know that can be done, right? Right. No, there's nothing in the Constitution that actually prevents that. It's the true answer. It's the true answer. Yes. That's all you have to say. And if they start questioning you about that and they start to deny it, all you have to say in response is, are you seriously telling me that Congress doesn't have the power to tell the Federal Reserve to place that money in the Treasury spending account? If you just right. keep repeating that, they won't be able to say a goddamn thing. They may bring up the question, K of inflation. They say, oh, you're talking about our printing money. Well, we don't have time to go into the inflation argument here today, but there are lots of answers to the inflation argument. And just as a matter of the history, okay, of this stuff, before they started doing the terrorism um, um, over the debt, during the 1970s, before that uh, time, every time we had an argument with the right concerning 
full employment versus the possibility of um, inflation in the economy, we, the progressives, won that argument. They lost every single time until the inflation of the late uh, 1970s, which wasn't caused by government spending. So the point is, we can win again if we get the issue shifted over, away from the national debt to inflation. Right. So I think that's an important thing to do. There was something else I wanted to show you also. Okay, and that is another graphic. That graphic gives the language that can be placed into appropriations bills in Congress to force the Fed to place the money for the appropriation in the Treasury spending account. And it is, I'll put this on solo again so you can see it, uh, the first sentence gives the Fed the order to place the appropriation in the Fed, uh, the Treasury spending account. The second sentence gives the Fed the order to place further money into the Treasury spending account, which would be necessary to pay off all of that part of the debt subject to the limit, the national debt, so called, that falls due during the period of the appropriation bill. So this language does two things. It pays for the appropriation and it pays for paying off the debt instruments. So eventually, over 30 years, there would be no more national debt. And within six months, roughly $4 trillion of the national debt would be paid off because a lot of it is debt falling due and very short-term debt that is also falling due. Okay, there must be $2 trillion of uh, the latter and also $2 trillion of the former in that kind of distribution. But within six months, you could point to the national debt being $4 trillion smaller. Mm -hmm. And you could give people the rap. Well, we've been telling you all along that debt's a false issue. Okay, that it's not a real issue. Right. Guess what? We just proved it because we paid off four mm -hmm. trillion dollars worth of it in six months using one sentence in the appropriations bill. So it was always a bullshit issue. If you want to use right. that language, you can use that language or be more prim and proper. <laughs> okay, and, you know, point out to people. Okay, but okay, my point is. We do know how to do this. We do know how it can happen. Other issues are raised by it. One is inflation, and the other is getting rid of the congressional um, um, pay-go issue. In other words, the procedures in Congress say that when you want to spend, first you pay for it, okay, and then you spend right. it. So... Mm -hmm. You have to defeat that. It starts in the House that way, and the congressional representatives have to change that procedure. And to the degree the Senate complies with that procedure, it too has to change that procedure. In other words, the order should be spend first, then decide how much you have to tax. And the reason why is that what you have to tax is what you have to do to drain inflationary pressures off. But no more than that. In other words, there are good reasons to be running deficits. Those reasons are the size of the trade deficit, the trade that drain money out of the private sector, and the size of private sector savings that also drain money out of the private sector. Altogether, there's evidence that the money drained would be up to 12% of GDP each year, giving us mm -hmm. deficit spending policy space of 2.4 trillion roughly. 
um, um, assuming a GDP of uh, roughly $20 trillion right now. So we could run a total deficit of $2.4 trillion and not run into inflationary pressures due to government spending. Right. So that's a fact. It's something to keep in mind. It's something to, uh, to argue with if these issues um, actually come up. Now, there are many very good reasons to tax, and I could bring that up uh, um, on the screen as well, but I wanted to st stop this and go over the other very good items um, in your platform so we could comment um, on those. Okay. Okay, so we're at... Uh, do you support saving taxpayers approximately $230 billion over 10 years um, um, but by allowing Medicare and Medicaid um, but to negotiate prices with um, the pharmaceutical companies? And you said yes. Okay. Right. Does saying yes imply then that you're against the Medicare for all bill passing? No, I don't think it well, does. Well, no. No, in fact, um, the only thing that we want to change in Medicare is to give give Medicare the opportunity to um, negotiate the drug pricing. But also, if we can get for profit out of the system, we can save uh, the as well. Because the, the insurance companies that, that are aligned with the Affordable Care Act are paying ridiculously high salaries to their CEOs. And all that money that could be spent if we were for profit or paid doctors directly, uh, we would be able to insure that many more people and more in insurance uh, instead of just, you know, throwing these ridiculous salaries out to the CEOs. Now, okay, Bernie talks so about that in a, a lot in his book. I, I don't know if you've read Bernie's book, Art of uh, Revolution, but that uh, is Well, I actually haven't read the book, but I think I know what he says about it, okay, because okay. I know what's in um, his Medicare for All bill. So my question to you is, do you support um, uh, uh, his Medicare for All bill? Yes, I think well, essentially he, well, well, I'm not sure that I think, I think you brought up a good point before I far enough. I think that getting the for-profit insurance companies uh, would reduce our overs of, of health care for everyone and still the health care that um, Bernie is trying to. Okay, so two things. We're getting considerable feedback from you now, so if you could uh, lower your volume further, that would be good. Okay. okay but uh, then the second thing I wanted to say, okay, and probably John wants to say it also, uh, so I'm going to give John a chance to comment on it now. Okay. Um, um, but John, um, um, have you got a comment, okay, that you'd like to make on this? On the Medicare for all, I'm all for it. And um, what, the last thing I'd want to see is, you know, what they usually do in their bills is add certain, like, things that don't benefit the people. Uh, but um, I do support uh, any bill that allows for health care to be accessible for all citizens of America. And I'm pretty sure that Lisa does agree with that, and that's what she wants. And, um, you know, I know her and I, and I know her team, and I, that's exactly what they're trying to do here in New Jersey. Let me tell you, in New Jersey, the federal, the, the federal government is, is, is not even involved. It's all state. And the pharmaceutical companies are all over the place here, and I'm sure she could speak to that. And um, that's what we're fighting here in this state. So it's very important what she's doing uh, because I know, uh, you know, Senator Menendez, doesn't want a Medicare for all. I can guarantee you that. Okay, so a couple of things about that. There's a Medicare for all bill, which is in the House right now. 
it used to be John Conyers' bill. It's now being managed, sponsored, um, actually by, uh, by Keith Ellison uh, in the House. It's H.R. 6, uh, but 76. It's a 35-page bill. Okay. It has provisions providing for increasing taxation to pay for Medicare for all. But it's really excellent when it comes to the benefits um, uh, uh, for Medicare for all. Uh, it has no co-pays. It has no deductibles. It covers just about everything you can think of uh, other than cosmetic stuff. It covers dental. It covers uh, psychiatry. It covers uh, the chiropractic. It covers all these with no copays again and no deductibles, no out-of-pocket uh, costs. Uh, everything is free to people at the point of uh, the service. Now, uh, people do disagree about how much this is going to save the private sector uh, out of um, uh, uh, our pockets. Uh, fairly conservative estimates uh, suggest that it would save us um, $600 billion a year off the $3.4 trillion we spend now. Less conservative but still reasonably conservative estimates say we would reach the level of Canada as a percent of our GDP which means that we would save something like $1.4 trillion per year uh, out of pocket. The most um, um, optimistic forecasts uh, that I've yet seen are that we would save 50% of the costs that we pay um, uh, uh, each year. Since again, these costs are now at $3.4 trillion, that means we would save $1.7 trillion per year or $17 trillion over 10 years, over what we're spending now, if we adopted H.R. 676, which the physicians for national uh, health program uh, by PNHP uh, say is the gold standard bill. Now the reason why they prefer that bill, or one of the reasons anyway why they prefer that bill to Bernie Sanders' bill is because Bernie Sanders' bill has a transition period. It's got a four-year transition period. Now the reason why a four-year transition period is a problem is because in suggesting that what Bernie Sanders is uh, suggesting is a trade-off of lives for insurance company jobs. Okay? Fatalities due to lack of coverage, to lack of health insurance during the um, Obama period totaled 356,000 fatality, fatalities that did not have to occur if he had passed H.R. 676 in 2009, which is what he should have done. Okay? Uh, if we assume that what's happening in 2017 and 2018 uh, would continue to raise the death toll, it's likely by the end of this year we will have a death toll since 2009 corresponding to 405,000 Americans who do not have to die due to lack of um, health insurance. So if we're going to run through a transition period of four years to get to full coverage, we're going to lose many thousands of lives each year in order to save some insurance company jobs to give them a chance to transition. I say that a much better plan is to pass your federal job guarantee bill, have 
Medicare for All bill actually implemented within a single year, losing the 650,000 jobs inside of the insurance industry, which then could be picked up either by the expansion of Medicare services to everybody um, in the population. And it's calculated that roughly 50% of those jobs would be picked up by the government, actually. But the other 50%, the other 325,000, could certainly be picked up at a living wage by the job guarantee program. And then all those people would not have to die to safeguard some jobs for the insurance companies. I put to you that that trade-off of jobs uh, versus fatalities for poor people who can't insure themselves is immoral, and we should not allow it to take place any longer. It should be the end of that. And I, I will send you, uh, um, send you an article with all of the estimates uh, that I've calculated that give you these particular numbers. And these estimates are based on the only empirical studies that have been done of um, uh, fatalities uh, uh, in this area. There is reason to doubt uh, the validity of these studies because they're based on fairly old kinds of data. But they're still the only empirical studies, okay, that are out there. If the conservatives don't like what they show, they can vote for Congress to pay for new studies. But yeah. until they do that, the best evidence we have is that we lost or are in the process of losing a total of 405,000 people since 2009 because they failed to pass H.R. 676 in 2009. Progressive candidates should be hitting them with this all the time that they, are, that they are guilty of this kind of loss of life because they would not pass a Medicare for All program. And Bob Menendez was in the Senate at that time. He was part of it. He was part of the refusal to pass a Medicare for All bill. He's partly responsible for this 405,000 fatality loss of life during this time. This is an issue you can run on in your race. Might even get you some right. coverage if you charge him with being partly responsible for losing 405,000 American lives. Let him right. then come back and say that you're soft on defense. I mean, right. we did lose only 3,000 people, you know, in 9-11. And this is a loss of life that's what? <laughs> I mean, it's... It's a hundred times that. It's more than a hundred right. times, right. almost a hundred fifty times what we lost to pay in nine eleven. So if he starts mm -hmm. talking about that, tell him to go dry up. <laughs> and that he's not capable of balancing off loss of life. Right. Okay. No, he's um, he has not stood. He has not stood his ground. <laughs> Um, uh, reasons that, um, what I would have talked about tonight if I was able to log on was the corruption and the inability to get rid of our public, public figures or public officials. I mean, he's been, he hasn't even been on the ballot for six years. So he's, you know, he's get our chances of getting him off the for misconduct. And I started my, my, what I was going to talk about tonight was how uh, corruption is so, um, it's very, very hard for progressive candidates to get elected. And you not only have the name recognition, you have your, and your money issue, but the way the party works in New Jersey, the, the gay incumbents, um, people who are starting out and trying to run a gay, um, have to, yes, I got a pet cat who has to, <laughs> who's going to walk into my, but, you know, um, or we haven't been able to overcome these, the Democratic Party, when I started, um, 
for endorsements, the first question they asked me was, and I wanted to remind them that the problem is we're at war with the one percenters. It's, it's the, we need to uh, embrace candidates that are not one percenters and not representative of the one who take bribes and and buy their, buy their way into elections. We need to get regular people elected. And they said, but now we're going to judge you on how likely you are to win. Well, you're not has a lot more money than you. Okay. And these were the two qualifications the Democratic Party uses for selecting their candidates. Now, I went further along to explain that in November, our choice will be because the Republicans in New Jersey feel the same way. They want to know who can win against us. And they are looking for the people with, with a Bob Hugan who has $40 million because they think he has a good get. Bob Menendez, who has, you know, the so they they compare how much money they have to see, okay, this is the likely candidate, not asking whether or not uh, Bob, CEO of a pharmaceutical company, or whether or not he has the more, you know, the moral compass, New Jerseyans, it's all, and so my proposal, Proposal and my my whole even my the reason that I'm running way for the progressives and teach the voters stop just I mean you know people even at the gun marches they were saying oh yeah we have to vote in November I said hold the phone wait till November to vote you're not going to be able to pick your candidates so and then I joined a progressive caucus good. I'll meet a bunch of people. People signed my petition. It was due on April. Um, the Progressive Caucus said, well, we're going to endorse pre-primary candidates. I said, why endorse? You're the progressive group. You're the uh, the Democratic okay, are Party. You, uh, were you talking about the Progressive Congressional Campaign Committee of the PCCC? Uh, no, this was a progressive caucus. It was a small uh, startup group. We have a lot of groups in New Jersey. Um, no, we have no. Our Revolution. We have Justice Democrats. We have Indivisible. And what I'm trying to is remind we are the 99%. We're fighting the one percenters. So we have to stop fighting. And if you don't endorse and teach people to prior to the primary and you leave it up to the Democratic Party, you're getting millionaires and people who are buying your, their way into the elections. Yes, now, I, 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 oh, we too certainly agree with that. And all of our people agree with that uh, also. But uh, once you said that, whether people are going to vote for you um, or not um, depends upon uh, what uh, first on what you're going to uh, to offer them, and secondly, right. if you're running against Bob Menendez, okay, it's also about his record and his performance. It's not simply about the corruption. Um, sure, the corruption is bad. But in a sense, it's an abstract issue. Okay, mm. uh, it, they have to be told how it translates into outcomes for them. If you talk about the four hundred five thousand fatalities due to a failure to pass uh, six um, seventy six in two thousand and nine, that's an outcome for them. A lot of those. 405,000 right. people who are necessarily died were New Jerseyans. Right. Whose lives Menendez could have saved had he had any guts in his body somewhere. If he wasn't right. such a <laughs> such a flabby flop doodle. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. uh, you know about everything. Well, we, we do need to teach the Democratic Party of the art of sinable since the Republican Party seems to have that mastered here in New Jersey. We just don't demand enough, and we don't stand by our principles. In the situation 
election where where he could he was able to shut down the government him and the other senators until we got um which he you know the immigration the daca and he could have kept the government shut down until we had the and he didn't stand his ground then he's had opportunities to stand his ground and do the right thing for people and he hasn't done it i agree i agree I agree. He hasn't done it. That's him. Uh, that's Menendez. That's the other corporate Democrats also. They're all like that. And that's why we have to get rid of them. And as right. you say, we have to vote for candidates who are going to work for the 99%. And of course, to do mm -hmm. that, you're in favor of getting money uh, out of politics, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I so do that. Um, that all has a democracy, uh, but basically it's uh, related. If we think that we're not paying, we're we're fooling ourselves. I mean, the way that elections are paid for is private donors will get political campaigns and then they'll write it off on their taxes. Well, why why have a middleman or someone who's going to be a private donator, donator? Why don't we just allow uh, the public financing of the elections so that it's there and, and it's not that lobbyists and, and buy up uh, officials? I mean... It, it shouldn't be legal to have lobbyists and Congress people uh, walking around, buddying around together. This is not a big interest that should be eliminated and enforced. But another people, or until we can get rid of the corrupt people elected, we end up, end up with these politicians that don't stand their ground, but we don't end up with a way to, and we really, Okay, so if we had public financing of campaigns, okay, right. it would um, certainly be very good. But that by itself right. would not stop uh, the large uh, 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 corporations and the wealthy people from also contributing their financial weight to campaigns. We would have to prohibit their contributions uh, and if we prohibited their contributions, we would have to then, or Congress would have to contend with the Supreme Court, which, of course, has said that, that money is uh, speech and has used that to declare unconstitutional um, uh, 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 previous campaign finance bills that restricted uh, their contributions. And that's so, just that's just plain wrong. That's just plain wrong because uh, according oh, yes, of to course, the rights of, of a course. person, and corporations okay, don't breathe their air. Okay, so of course it is plain wrong. Uh, we both completely agree with you. But the question is, what do we do about it in order to stop it? Okay, so what in, do you intend to in, do about it if if you should win the election? Okay, well, in uh, Tom Hartman's book, Screwed, he explains how corporations got rights that they had today, and there was no rule that said corporations had human rights. What they had was a memo that suggested that they wanted to do this, and then one of the parties used that as a a ruling and said that this that corporations have human rights and then because somebody else said it well we know the Donald Trump logic well I said it and you repeated it back to me and then I heard you say it so it must be true you look back and, and find out the error of how the corporations got their rights we would make sure that they were revoked okay well uh Okay, there are a couple of things here. First of all, this has happened through various interpretations of the Supreme Court going back to the 1880s. 
The first uh, such decision, as I recall, was in 1884 in a railroad case where a judicial clerk um, um, actually added a comma to a decision that he had um, no business adding. And then that was interpreted right. by later Supreme Courts as um, actually uh, being a valid precedent that was set in that case uh, that it thought, okay, that it had to follow because it thought, okay, it was a legitimate precedent okay, when actually it was an error by the clerk in the Supreme Court. So that's one of, uh, you know, right. the crazy accidents, okay, of history, which has turned out extremely bad for us. However, there have been a string of decisions um, uh, since then that have strengthened the rights of the corporations um, 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 under the Constitution. And the way candidates are normally suggesting that we ought to get around it is by saying we need to pass an amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that what you're suggesting also? how to undo the false references and all of the subsequent uh, to find out how that has to be undone or if what you're suggesting is not have to get an amendment made. Um, but okay, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting there should be an amendment, okay, and right. I'm suggesting that uh, what it should assert okay, is that um, artificial persons uh, are not entitled to the same rights under the 14th Amendment, okay, or um, any previous amendments or any laws that um, um, individual persons have. That the clear intent of the founders was to limit individual rights under the constitutions to biological uh, individuals and not to uh, the um, artificial uh, um, artificial uh, uh, persons that um, corporations are. Okay, and so by stating that um, corporations, okay, as artificial persons can have their rights actually limited by national legislation and by state legislation, uh, uh, we also eliminate uh, these decisions um, um, of the Supreme Court. But having said that, we're talking about a seven to ten year process to get that done. Mm -hmm. And we can't wait for seven to ten years to get money out of politics. Mm -hmm. We need to get money out of politics now. So if we got ourselves a progressive Congress, the question is, how do we do that when the CU decision stands in our way. Right. And the answer yeah, to that question, to... there is an answer to yeah. that question. And the answer to that question is that there is an exceptions clause in the Constitution. It's in Article 3, Section 2, and you can look it up. It's a short phrase. Okay, and what it says is it gives Congress the authority to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court so that it cannot have jurisdiction over a particular piece of legislation that is being passed by the Congress. So you could pass a new campaign finance laws which uh, re-empowered all the old campaign finance laws and also pass new campaign finance restrictions on corporations, including right. declarations that corporations were artificial persons and were not entitled to the same rights, okay, as individuals, and then prohibit the Supreme Court from having jurisdiction over that particular legislation, and the Supreme Court would be powerless to stop that. Right. This is a clause, this small exceptions clause, was paced, placed in Article 3, Section 2 by the framers of the Constitution. As far as I know, it has never been used. However, mm. it was placed in them there 
to prevent the judicial power from running amok precisely for that particular purpose, which our current Supreme Court has been doing since the year 2000, plainly going beyond the Constitution and all sorts of decisions it has made, starting with Bush v. Gore. Okay, mm-hmm. And it's time the Congress stood up and took back its power and said, no, no, Supreme Court, you have gone too far. And it can do that in new campaign finance laws. So I'm calling for you to support such campaign finance laws with that exceptions clause from Article 3, Section 2 in the campaign finance laws to prevent the Supreme Court from overturning uh, those laws. That's your answer. It's in Article 3, Section 2. Go look it up, okay, and get to know it. It's simple. Okay. And it's there for a progressive Congress to do. Now, I've run this by Tim Canova and 30 other candidates. No one's been able to find any fault with it. And Tim Canova, who's a law professor, by the way, has said he checked it out. Okay. And he also said he learned it from me, you know, from watching one of my broadcasts. At the time he mentioned it, uh, oh, that was in an interview. Okay, um, I was interviewing him, okay, and I heard him say that. Okay, and I thought that he'd figured it out for himself. Okay, but then he followed up saying that he originally heard that from me, and he checked it out, and he agreed. Right. Okay, so I have the agreement of a law professor um, on this, and I don't have a contribu- uh, I don't have a contradiction. Uh, from any of the, I don't know how many candidates, okay, I've interviewed now, okay, about this, and I've always brought this up. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that's how to get around that. Okay. Okay, so getting back to your platform now, because, again, I think uh, it's really a very good one, and I want to make sure that everybody knows about the whole platform, everybody watching. Okay. Uh, you also have the item, do you support a Medicare um, buy-in for all, which would allow any Americans the choice of buying into the federal Medicare program instead of uh, by buying private insurance? Uh, and you said mm-hmm. yes to that, okay, and I would say no. And, of course, the reason why I would say no okay, is that Uh, I would be in support, as you say you are, of passing a Medicare for All bill in the first place. Obviously, if you're going to fight, right, if you're going to fight for a Medicare for All bill, this is not needed. It's much too Mm -hmm. soft a compromise. Now, if forced to the wall, you might want to make such a compromise. It's better than nothing. It's a compromise currently favored by Jeff Merkley. First time I heard that compromise, it was stated by uh, Alan Grayson in 2009. So Alan Grayson was offering that up instead of a public option in 2009, and in nearly almost a decade now. Hey, John, come back, please. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, so for a decade now, okay, almost mm-hmm. a decade, we're still talking about the same shitty compromise. Right. So let's recognize it as such and say things like, no, I'm not going to compromise on that. I want a Medicare for all bill. It's okay. By now, with all these people who've died, it's Medicare for all or bust. We owe it to them right. so that they have not died in vain. That's what you say. Right. Just like what okay. they say about our service people. Make sure they have not died in vain. Let's win this war mm-hmm. so they have not died in vain. Let's win our war for Medicare for All so these people have not died in vain. We have to recognize their deaths and how important that they were. Okay. So... Do you support breaking up too big to fail financial institutions, even if that means breaking up some of the major powers on Wall Street? And you say yes, and I say 
yes, that's perfectly correct. Then you say, do you believe there has been an adequate prosecution of bankers who engaged in illegal activity before and during the 2007-2008 financial crisis? And you say yes to that. And I say yes to do. I'm, I'm right with you on that. That's terrific. And you ask, do you want to end the tax loophole that allows Wall Street banks and other corporations that get caught breaking the law to deduct the cost of their fines from their tax bill. And of course you say yes to that. And of course you're right. Of course you're right. Of course that's what should happen. You should ask Menendez whether he favors that. You should ask mm -hmm. him. You should write an open letter asking him, does he favor that or not? Will he go on the line for that? Will he sign a contract for that? Ask him to sign the CFAR. Okay, do you support uh, restoring the wall between commercial and investment banking, Glass-Steagall, to protect family savings from being used for risky Wall Street um, speculation? Well, I don't know about the second half of that because I don't think that uh, banks actually lend out the savings of families. What they do instead is they create money against the notes, okay, of loans. They're authorized by the Federal Reserve to do that. So it isn't based on the savings. And savings are right. protected in various ways. Okay, so that part of it, okay, is not right. But still, still, you want to stop financial crashes. And right. passing a successor to Glass-Steagall is something we need to do to stop these financial crashes, which are damaging to all of the rest of us. They shouldn't be allowed to gamble on Wall Street and be banks that can draw against the resources of the Federal Reserve at the same time. The investment banks should not be banks in the sense that right. they're part of the Federal Reserve system. There has to be a wall right. there that doesn't allow them. And Goldman Sachs in particular should be kicked out of regular banking and put back where they were before Glass-Steagall was repealed. Mm -hmm. So, do you support and I, believe, I, I just wanted to add, I believe Bob Menendez is looking to um, expand uh, the the privileges so that, that they can now uh, gamble with money market accounts. Like he's not only happy with where they are with restrict, um, but he he wants to uh, give them the banks more freedom to invest in in risky endeavors. And you can attack him on that. You can definitely right. attack him on that. And you can say, look right. at what he wants to do. He wants to make it more possible to have financial crashes on Wall Street. Do you remember what the last financial crash did to all of us? Is it so far in the past that you've forgotten that something like $9 trillion in value was lost off people's homes because of what Wall Street did? And this moron wants to give him a chance to do it again? That's what you say. Right. That's what you run on. That's the way to run. So, do you support giving share, shareholders a binding vote to approve or disapprove of CEO pay packages? And you say, yes, I support giving shareholders a binding vote. Of course, you sh of course they should have a binding vote on that. It shouldn't be the case where a minority is allowed to raise these pay packages to the skies. It should right. be something all shareholders have a voice over. That's only basic democracy. Okay, so then the question, a tax loophole allows corporations to take tax deductions um, for executive compensation. Okay, by the way, I think this question and answer stuff here, it's, it's really wonderful that you put this up um, um, on your website because people can see exactly where you stand okay, on all of these issues 
and they can see that again and again on every issue you are for the people mm-hmm. and you're not for the corporations and for the wealthy right and that's what they have to know and the more issues that you can say but bob menendez doesn't agree with this he thinks that the more you can give that refrain the more you can strip people from him and get them into your corner so uh you have a tax loophole allows corporations to take tax deductions for executive copy uh compensation do you support um eliminating that deduction for companies that pay their ceos more than 50 times their median worker salary in order to encourage them to pay employees uh more and reduce income uh inequality <laughs> and you say yes, yes to that and that's good but i'd also say that it's probably not enough uh mm-hmm. just a few days ago okay i interviewed uh but dimitri cherney from the south carolina first who's running against uh, Mark um, um, Sanford in that particular district. And he is saying that that salary cap that should be passed by Congress should be 30 times the minimum wage in America, not the median wage for any company, but no more than 30 times the minimum wage part of the reason for that is to give corporation heads the incentive to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour or even higher because in the act of doing that they're going to be able to raise their own pay because it's only 30 times more than that okay but also okay the 30 times more okay is less than what you have but since the 30 times more the lowest salary in the united states right. it's pretty restrictive and also pretty effective in building greater equality uh over time okay is there as mm-hmm. long as there are no loopholes okay and ways for them to get out of it it has to be their total compensation not just their salaries your total right. compensation has to be involved with they doing that so uh do you support elizabeth warren's call for a banking option through the us post office to provide competition to wall street banks and give consumers more choice for basic services uh and you say yes and I think that's another of course it's another thing that would be very good um for people and my wife Bonnie is pointing to her watch here <laughs> <laughs> yeah but anyway uh so yes to provide competition to wall street banks and give consumers more choice for basic services yes i think postal banking would be wonderful uh um, all over Europe it's done it used to be done here okay it works well the private lobbies drove it out of existence here we need that for the people that's a wonderful thing do you support increasing income taxes on those making over 250,000 a year in wages or capital gains so that our system of taxation is more progressive and everyone pays their fair share uh yes i do support that uh, but uh, what i'll also say about that is if you push for that and you can't get support in congress for doing something like that but you can trade it off okay. you can trade it off okay in order to get uh something for people okay uh you know you can make a bargain let the unfair taxation go on for a little longer 
in return, mm -hmm. let's say, for expanding Social Security benefits or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for expanding the, uh, the minimum wage or passing the limited compensation bill that we just had specified, okay, or whatever it is that's for the people that you need to get through, then giving way on taxes is always worthwhile because, as I showed you before, you don't need taxes to pay for anything. You only right. need them to drain money from the economy so that we don't have an inflationary um, economy. And you've got $2.4 trillion in deficit spending to start with. And as GDP expands every year, that figure will be more. Because that 12% mm -hmm. of GDP that leaks out of the economy, that's going to happen every single year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 12% of a growing GDP is more and more money each year that can be spent on things that we need. So, uh, we've said a lot tonight, and it is two hours and ten minutes. We're not through your whole platform. Uh, on all of these questions, other than the taxation questions, your platform is extremely progressive on one after another question. Okay, is there any answer that before we go uh, you would like to highlight? Mm -hmm. Okay, or is um, there any kind of overview statement, okay, that you would like to make uh, yeah, uh, um, for our bunch? So somebody says, uh, oh, Joe is out um, after curfew. Okay, he might have added yeah, yeah, that. Joe is out like, after curfew. Yeah, I, well, like I said, the, my, my closing remark was just, um, you know, in order to um, in, uh, make any of these changes, you know, we have to uh, first get elected. And I'm very happy that you have the support that you had tonight because it's the people today who are staying and paying attention to you and paying attention to politics that are are going to um, to help us uh, prevail. So, okay, uh, okay. So uh, there are a few things. Okay, that I would like to say. Uh, those things relate, first of all, um, to your donation page. Where can people find that page? Uh, yeah, it's, if it's at the moved website. To make a donation. Yeah, it's the www.lisamccormick.org website, and it's slash donate. Okay, so it's actually on you. my website. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, one more question for you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what day is your primary? June 5th. Okay, I thought it was something like that. Now, um, 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 if you lose, are you going to continue your run as an independent? No. No, the, the way New Jersey's, um, I am going to run again for something else, uh, probably assembly, but the way um, New Jersey set up, in order to have a chance at the, um, at the election process, you need to attack the Democratic par uh, primary. The Democratic primary, you need the fewest number of votes and you have the most, elect um, most educated voters. In fact, I can win in June with one out of 22 people voting. Okay, and what is that, um, the total for the state? The total number is about 250,000. So if you get 250,000 people voting for you on June 5th, uh, then you think you can win? Yes. Okay, and you don't yes. think that I mean, Bob Menendez can get more than 250,000 people. He is the least 
uh, favorite candidate out there, my experience with um, talking to people. I've had people ask me, can I sign your petition six times? I really want to get rid of this guy. So he's he's getting his diehard supporters that are going to come out, whether it rains or, or snows. Um, and, and he's probably going to get close to what he got uh, the last time, which was, I think, of something 175,000 votes or something like that. Um, but there isn't he he doesn't inspire anyone to come out so anybody who doesn't care who is on the fence my voters they have to be inspired they have to know that they have a choice and they have to realize that you know that there's a lot of good that can come from um electing me and everybody i've talked to was very excited just knowing that they had the choice okay so uh Russell Gorman, one of our very active commenters, says, let her come back and finish going over her platform. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you like to come back sometime uh, before the election to finish going over your platform? Sure. Okay, if you'd like you to do that. I don't have okay. a specific uh, I, date in mind as yet because I have to check the schedule, but uh, we okay. here would very much like to see you win, okay? okay? And we'd like to see Bob lose. Yes. So uh, <laughs> we would be really very pleased at that particular result. I can tell you, though, that if he loses... He will probably come back and try to run as an independent. He can try. It's not likely in in the Dem in in New Jersey. We have we have been a blue state, and we have had so many successful Democrats running the state. It's hard for us to get a Republican elected, and they've got a a, a fair share of voters that come out just like the Democrats rain or shine and you know they're starting with the bigger numbers so as an independent you're already starting at less than what the what the uh, one of the main two parties can bring you which is makes it that much more of an expensive race and that much more of an uphill battle okay Lisa well um, right. thank you very much for this interview Okay, I'm going to uh, to let you uh, go now. Okay. And, um, I'll be in touch, okay, about another interview before June 5th. Okay, mm -hmm. I wish you luck until then. I hope you rip into them hard now because time is getting okay. short. Right. Okay, okay. Right, good luck, Lisa. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, uh, here we are again. I'm going to give my final message. Thank you for hanging in there for so long. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to say now is uh, um, um, to remind you that uh, Real Progressives has a Patreon page. And we'd certainly appreciate it if uh, you will move to go there and to make a donation. I have a Patreon on page two. Okay, and I would be very pleased okay, if you were moved, okay, to make a donation. I also want to thank uh, by John Lancelot, my special guest, for coming into the broadcast to pinch hit for Lisa for more than the first hour of this broadcast. Okay. I'm very grateful to him. He was his usual very, very um, combative and fighting self. I've really always enjoyed uh, talking with John. Okay, And again, I'm very grateful to him for um, uh, helping me uh, to start this show and to pinch it uh, for Lisa and to giving uh, his commentary on much of um, her platform. So, um, a good night now. Uh, 
I will certainly thank John um, after the broadcast is over and thank Lisa um, um, as well. And uh, I'll send some figures and some documents to both to help them in their campaign. Okay. So thank you very much, um, everyone. Okay. And good night again. Yeah. Kudos to John, Mark. Yeah. <laughs>